These are the sounds of wild chimpanzees. We've all seen chimps in zoos, in movies, and on television. Because they are portrayed as comical little men, it's tempting to think the sounds they make are a language, that they are talking to one another. For the last few hundred years, most scientists would have dismissed such an idea as nonsense. They would have told you that the sounds made by chimpanzees, or any other animals, are nothing but random noises without meaning, that only humans, alone in all creation, have the power of speech. We now know, however, that the truth lies somewhere in between. Chimpanzees do not have a true language, but the sounds they make are not random or meaningless either. They're not exactly speaking, but they are communicating. They're giving one another important information. This is but one of the startling lessons learned by a remarkable woman named Jane Goodall, who has spent more than a quarter of a century living among the wild chimpanzees of East Africa. Mess messages are conveyed in various ways. There are a number of calls, far more than we used to think, probably about 48 different calls, all meaning different, slightly different things, which can be interpreted by chimpanzees hearing them. For example, there's uh, the typical distance call is the pantoot. Do you want me to make a pantoot? Yes, I would. <laughs> uh, we used to lump pantoots as pantoots. Now, it turns out that there are probably at least six different kinds of pantoots. There's the pantoot, which you make when you're up on top of a ridge and you're wondering if there's anybody in the next valley. And this is a questioning kind of pantoot. There's a pantoot that you make when you're approaching a food tree, uh, an arrival pantoot. There's a pantoot which you make when there's great excitement after the eating of uh, the, after a successful hunt, when everybody's gathered to eat meat. There's a wonderful pantoot that's made sometimes in the evening, just before the nests are made, when the chimps have a full tummy and they're happy, and it's, it's almost like singing, and that's the nesting pantoot. Each chimpanzee has his or her own completely distinctive voice, so that if you hear a pantoot, any of the different pantoots, you know which chimpanzee is making that call. At any rate, we have our vocal communication. Uh, we also have communication by touch, posture, and gesture. And this is very, very meaningful, probably the most meaningful. Uh, but this, of course, only applies within a, within a group when the chimpanzees are close to each other. There's also, to some extent, olfactory communication, communication by smell, which we see when a male is examining the genital area of a female. He touches it and sniffs his finger and this gives him some clues about her reproductive state. We also see this illustrated quite dramatically when a party of male chimps are out on a patrol near the boundary of the range when they're moving so quietly, listening so carefully. They're also bending down, sniffing the ground, picking up a twig, sniffing it, and this clearly is giving them information about the whereabouts of strangers or perhaps how recently they were there. That was Dr. Jane Goodall, and this is On the Earth, a part of the audio series, The Secret World of Animals. This series is an introduction to the science of ethology, the study of animal behavior. In this segment, we will hear about and listen to some very advanced mammals. Mammals which are, in fact, the cousins of humanity. Our narrator and guide is David Tarno. That was Dr. Alan Emery marine biologist and director of the Canadian Museum of Nature. European and North American scientists have studied the chimpanzee for more than 300 years, capturing them in the wild and bringing them home to zoos and laboratories for observation. It's only in our times, however, that anyone has attempted to study the chimpanzee on its own territory, and it is this study which has given us our first real insights into the rich complexity of chimpanzee life. 
The study was conducted by a young Englishwoman named Jane Goodall, who began preparing for a career in ethology before she could even say the word. I was interested in animals from as far back as I can remember. In fact, I've been told about a great interest I had when I was only one and a half and two, how I would watch insects and take worms to bed with me to see what they did. I had a very understanding mother who would come and find earthworms under my pillow, and instead of saying, ooh, horrible things, throw them away, she would say, Jane, if these are kept out of the earth any longer, they'll die. So then I was very anxious to get them back into the garden. So I really think I was born with that interest. The first creature that really taught me a lesson was a barnyard chicken. And I was staying with my grandmother in the country, and I couldn't understand where an egg came from. Where was there a hole big enough on a, on a hen? So I went into a hen house after I'd seen a, a hen going in there. But of course, she flew out in great distress. So I learned at the age of four that to watch animals, you must be very patient. I had to go into the hen house before a hen went in there, and then I had to wait. And in fact, I waited so long to see this first egg being laid that my mother had called the police. Nobody knew where I was. But I still remember seeing the chicken rise up and this white circular thing coming out. And it was just very, very exciting. And then after that, all through the rest of my childhood, I went out for nature walks. I had a wonderful dog who taught me such a lot about animals and animal behavior. And then ultimately I saved up money and went out to Africa because that's where I felt the really interesting animals were. Jane Goodall was just out of high school when she first went to Africa. She paid her way with money she saved from a summer job as a waitress. Her destination was a remote valley in Kenya, a place called Aldivai, where she hoped to get a job with a researcher named Louis Leakey. L Louis Leakey was a paleontologist, and he had for many, many years been digging up the remains of early humans at Aldivai, stone tools for the most part. And he was, of course, able to piece together what early humans looked like from the bones and skulls and teeth that he found. But how did they live? What was their social behavior like? How were the relationships between individuals and between family members? He felt that if we could learn something about our closest human relatives, the chimpanzees and the other great apes, that this might give us at least some idea as to how our own early human ancestors behaved. The meeting with Lewis Leakey came quite soon after I'd first arrived in East Africa. I got to Kenya, where one of my old school friends had moved with her family. People said to me, if you want to study animals, you should go and see Lewis Leakey. At that time, he was director of the Natural History Museum in Nairobi. So I went to meet him and told him what I was interested in. He took me around the museum. He was very impressed because I understood what herpetology was and ichthyology and things like that, even though I'd not been to university at all. And so he offered me a job, first of all, as an assistant working for him in the museum. Then he took me on one of the digs to Aldivai. And that, of course, was wonderful because in those days, this is 1957, there were no roads to Aldivai. It was wild and free, just a, a remote part of the Serengeti. And I just carried on watching animals in all my free time. And this was when Lewis began to think, well, here perhaps is the person I've been waiting for who can go and study chimpanzees out in the wild. Lewis Leakey seems to have been a man who placed great faith in his instincts. Despite the fact that she was very young and had no formal training as a scientist, he sent Jane Goodall off into the wilds of Tanzania to live among chimpanzees. He would later take another young novice, Diane Fossey, and entrust her to study gorillas in Zaire and Rwanda. The destination Leakey chose for Jane Goodall was the game reserve of Gombe on the shores of Lake Tanganyika. It was a remote, uninhabited area, uninhabited, that is, by people. It was home to a large population of wild and possibly ferocious chimpanzees. The first problem I had at Gombe 
was to get the chimpanzees used to seeing me around. They were very, very scared of this peculiar white-skinned ape, and they would rush off even if I was 500 meters away. And it took a long time before I could get close to any of them. So initially, I would climb up to one of the open ridges or peaks between the thickly forested valleys, and sitting there with my binoculars would gradually piece together the daily behavior patterns of the chimps. And then, because they repeatedly saw me sitting there, they gradually began to realize that I wasn't quite as dangerous as I had seemed at first. It was very interesting to see how their behavior went through various stages. First, they were frightened. Then, as fear left them, they became aggressive. And there were some very frightening times at the beginning of my study when this belligerence towards me was very apparent. One rather striking example was when I unexpectedly came upon a group of chimps in the rain. And they were very close. They hadn't seen me. And I sat down, kept still and quiet. And quite suddenly, one of the chimps did see me. And he rushed off into the bushes, and I thought, well, that's it, they'll all run off. But they didn't all run off. One of them came quite close and began shaking the branches. Then another one from some place where I couldn't see charged towards me, all his hair bristling, and only at the very last minute did he veer away. Then I found another one in the tree above shaking branches, and I could hear one behind. And the whole group, probably 10 of them all together, began giving the alarm call which is a very uh, spine-chilling sound, really. And I didn't know what they'd do. I mean, nobody knew in those days what a group of wild chimps might do. So I began digging in the ground and eating little leaves. I hoped that because I wasn't interested in them, they would go away, and they did. But uh, that was quite a, a bad moment. Anyhow, they went through this belligerent phase, and then gradually they began to tolerate me, to accept me. I wouldn't say they became really friendly, but very, very tolerant. And that is something which even today, after 27 years, I find very moving, that I can be out there in a group of chimps, and they will be peacefully resting, perhaps a young one asleep with his head near my foot, totally trusting, totally tolerant, and it's something I can never take for granted. I find it very, very wonderful even now. And equally, it gives you a, a real determination that somehow, never, never, never must their trust be betrayed. When I first went to Gombe, I was absolutely fascinated in the behavior of the chimps. I was extremely zealous in trying to habituate them, get them used to me so that I could get closer, writing down everything I saw. But I didn't have any kind of theoretical background which would enable me to interpret this in the most meaningful way. In other words, to share it as best I could, not only with lay people, but also with other scientists. And when I went to Cambridge University, I was very fortunate in having as my supervisor Professor Robert Hind, who probably has one of the most analytical, critical minds in ethology. And Robert showed me the importance of concentrating one period of observation on one particular individual so that you can get a much more detailed record of the behavior of each individual, which of course is terribly important when you have animals as individually different as chimps are. Jane Goodall was fortunate to find herself at Cambridge under the tutelage of Professor Robert Hind, for Hind is one of the founders of the modern science of ethology. I was the only person studying really the behavior of monkeys in England in the early 60s, and Lewis Leakey, the anthropologist, wanted a supervisor for the students that he was sending out to study chimpanzees and gorillas. So that started an association with Jane Goodall and with Diane Fossey, who were both students here, and with many students who subsequently worked in their camps. Neither Jane Goodall nor Diane Fossey were trained as scientists when they started their work. And they were both first-rate observers, 
but they knew little about systematic data collection. And the small role that I played in their work was really to try and teach them how to collect data systematically, both while they were actually watching the animals and how to collate it subsequently. I want quickly to say that I learned just as much from them as I taught them because they taught me about the individuality of the animals, about many subtleties of their behaviour that I would never have become alert to had I not had the opportunity of working with them. Now, Jane Goodall set up a camp on the shores of Lake Tanganyika and has studied continuously the chimpanzees living there over a period now of over 20 years. Uh, it's a remarkable body of work which traces the history of a chimpanzee community and its ups and downs, its uh, wars, its coalitions and so on over this period. And it's involved uh, detailed studies of individual life histories. And it's really a unique study of animals in the wild, quite apart from its relevance to man. Diane Fossey set up a similar enterprise a few years later in the, first of all in Zaire and then in Rwanda. It's a very different place, it's a uh, cloud forest at about nine or 10,000 feet. It's in very difficult conditions, continually damp and wet through very high vegetation. But the gorillas are the most m wonderful animals, and one of the some of the most amazing experiences of my life have, has been to go out with Diane Fossey, and she would uh, track the animals for three or four hours until eventually we caught up with them. And this was pretty hard going up and down the cones of these volcanoes in very deep earth, with uh, where your feet sank in, sometimes almost up to your knees and through high vegetation so that you had to cut your way through the vegetation. And eventually uh, we'd hear the gorilla in the distance and Diane would beat her chest like that and the gorilla would respond and then uh, one would gradually work one's way closer to them and break the gallium stalks in imitation of uh, gorilla feeding. And then suddenly the uh, vegetation would break apart and a gorilla weighing several hundred pounds would lie down at your feet and start playing with your bootlaces. And that was the most amazing experience that I've ever had in watching animals. Jane Goodall's job at Gombe, both before and after she received her academic credentials, was very like that of a watcher. She was to watch and record everything the chimpanzees did without regard to any preconceived ideas about what was important and what was not. Everything was equally important in building an accurate and complete picture of chimpanzee society. And she quickly learned that chimpanzees do have a society. The picture of chimpanzee life that I was able to put together in those early days, sitting up on the peak with my binoculars, was relatively comprehensive, actually. I learned, for a start, that they do not travel around their range in a troop like baboons or gorillas or most monkeys, but rather they travel around in small, constantly changing associations. The only really stable group is a mother and her dependent young. I learned that there were approximately 50 individuals in one community, all of whom could sometimes interact together in a peaceful way even though, as I say, they spent most time moving around in small groups. Sometimes they would all join together when there was a specially desirable fruit in one area, for example, or when there was a female, sexually attractive female. And the chimpanzees, like humans, sleep all night. They make themselves a comfortable nest. A small group will sleep fairly close in the same tree or a group of adjoining trees babies will sleep with their mothers until they're five years old. They get up in the morning when light comes. There's a, very often a lot of excitement first thing in the morning, particularly if some of the adult males are there. Then they settle down and feed. Then they wander off. Perhaps midday they rest, either on the ground in the dry season or up in the trees on nests when the ground is cold and wet in the rainy season. They feed again. They wander off stopping from time to time to take a little 
berry here or shoot there. They climb up and feed again quite intensively before they make their nests for the next night. I think the fascinating thing about the chimps is, which of course I've learned more about over the years, but which I began to learn about even in the early days, is how very different one day can be from another. A group of males, for example, may set out to patrol the boundaries of their territory, which is going to be about 12 to 15 square kilometers. And this will be very exciting, tense time for them. They creep from uh, one patch of vegetation to another. They're looking out over the uh, territory of the neighbors. They're very silent, keep very close together, very scared if there's a sudden sound. And then if they see a stranger from a neighboring community, they may chase or even attack. When they come back to the center of the home range, this tremendous excitement is like releasing all the pent-up emotion of the day, and the males will charge about, hurling rocks and making a lot of noise. And so that can be a very exciting day. On another day, there may be a hunt. The males and sometimes the females cooperate to hunt young monkeys, young bush buck, young bush pigs, occasionally even a young baboon. And this, again, is uh, a very... Uh, exciting occupation for them, particularly if they're successful and make a kill. All the chimps within earshot gather around to share the food. And on another day, they may just wander from one patch of food to another to another, covering a very short distance. Maybe one male completely by himself. So you have a complete difference in mood from one day to another sometimes. It was with these kinds of mundane observations that Lewis Leakey hoped to reconstruct a picture of what life might have been like for the primitive inhabitants of Aldivai, the Earth's oldest known human community. The chimpanzees, after all, lived in an environment much like what the people of Aldivai might have known. Their behavior might hold valuable clues into the shaping of our patterns of behavior during the course of human evolution. I think that we can fairly safely say that behavior which is shared by modern man and modern chimpanzee was probably present in the common ancestor going back a few million years and therefore probably present in our own early ancestors. And if we accept this as at least perhaps true, then we can imagine our early ancestors hunting together, cooperating, to kill small animals. We can imagine them sometimes scavenging. We can imagine them using and making tools. And of course, this was one of the things that really excited Lewis Leakey, the first example of tool using. And he said, well, this means that we must either redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> he was really excited. Um, and chimpanzees do, in fact, use more objects for a greater variety of purposes than any other creature except ourselves in the wild. Um, so we can certainly imagine our early ancestors using little pieces of twig and grass for tools in the same kind of way as the chimpanzees do. We can imagine, I think, these close bonds between the members of a family lasting throughout life. We can imagine those early Stone Age ancestors kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another on the back. We can imagine them sometimes showing altruistic behavior and saving one another from danger during a hunt or perhaps during intercommunity conflict. We can presume that they showed the beginning of that territorial behavior which in our own species has led to human warfare. And so I think that Lewis Leakey's vision has been really very, very well justified. Through Jane Goodall's observations, Leakey's ideas were indeed very well justified. There were times when the humanity of chimp behavior patterns startled the observers. Professor Robert Hind. One very important time at Jane Goodall's camp, and I was lucky to be there at the time, was when a very elderly female called Flo died. Flo was a female that Jane had known for many years and was very aged. 
And she had a child, if I remember right, of about six, five or six, and had another baby which she lost. And she devoted her maternal attention to Flint so that Flint was a very much overprotected baby. When the mother died, she, her body was found in a stream. Flint stayed by his mother's body for days, and I happened to be there at the time, and I and a student watched this continuously for several days. And eventually, after a few weeks, I've forgotten exactly how long it was after I left the camp, uh, Flint just died. Now, he certainly had a lot of parasitic infections and things, but it was very difficult to avoid the conclusion that he died simply because his mother was di had died and she'd been such an overprotective mother he just couldn't cope on his own. You see, the young chimp suckles for the first five years of its life, begins to eat solids at two and a half, but uh, continues to nurse until the next pregnancy. And there is a five or six year spacing between um, live babies in the wild so that the period of time when the child is alone with the mother and dependent on her for food, for transport, for company, for play, for everything, is very long, five solid years before the next baby is born. And we now know that bonds between mothers and offspring can last throughout life. We have these strong bonds which are so meaningful to the young chimp as he grows up that it's as though when he begins to spend time away from his mother or when she begins to spend time away from her mother at about age eight or nine, the kind of reassurance which they derived as youngsters from the maternal arms, that is, after being frightened or hurt, an infant will run to seek reassurance from the mother. And then when the child begins to spend time away from the mother, out with the rest of society, he seems to be seeking the same kind of reassurance from other familiar members of the community. And it's impossible to overemphasize the importance in chimp society of friendly physical contact. Hours and hours and hours that the infant spends in contact with his mother. Hours that he spends in gentle, friendly play with other youngsters as he grows up. For the most part, the young chimp is very well tolerated by other adults, at least until he or she becomes an adolescent, about nine or ten. Mother chimpanzees definitely do discipline their youngsters, but initially, anyway, in a very gentle way. At first, if the baby does something the mother doesn't want it to do, she tends to play with it or groom it and distract its attention. As it gets older, around four or five, particularly when she begins the process of weaning, which can be quite traumatic and quite long drawn out, then if the child persists in trying to ride on her back or in trying to suckle, then she may administer mild physical punishment, typically biting the hand gently. And what is important again here, sometimes particularly a male child will become very distressed at maternal rejection and discipline of this sort, may actually throw quite violent tantrums, rush off, hurl itself onto the ground, hit the ground, bang its head, scratch its hair, screaming loudly. Now almost always the mother will then follow the child, take it even if it doesn't want to come and it's probably pulling away by this time, very firmly hold it in an embrace until it calms down. And it's as though her message is, you can't ride on my back, or you can't have milk, but I still love you.
adolescence for the male chimp is quite a turbulent and frustrating time. He begins to leave his mother. He's absolutely fascinated by the adult males. When he starts moving away from the family, he's almost always with one or more of the big adult males. He watches what they do. He very often imitates what they do. Sometimes he will pick upon one particular adult male and in a way hero worship that individual and imitate his behavior and follow closely behind him. At the same time as he's getting more fascinated by these big males, he's more cautious because behavior he could get away with as a mere juvenile is now sometimes producing uh, an aggressive response from the big males. He mustn't get too close when they're feeding, for example. He must keep his distance from a female in estrus. And also, he's very likely to be a scapegoat when the big males are aggressive and there's some tension, particularly between two close in dominance. One of them may turn around and redirect his aggression on a conveniently handy adolescent male. So he's in a conflict there. He wants to be with them, but he's scared. Sometimes he then searches out his mother and spends time with her. And at the same time, he's beginning to be more aggressive. His testosterone levels are rising. He's gaining in weight. He's beginning to challenge the females and gradually intimidating all of them. And then he starts to find himself a position in the hierarchy of the adult males. He challenges one that's sick or a very uh, old adult male or a very low-ranking one for some other reason. And gradually he works his way into this society. Working his way into society means for the young male chimpanzee carving a niche for himself in the hierarchy of adult males. He must compete with the other males for the attention of the females. How much attention he gets, or whether he gets any at all, can depend on how important he is in relation to the other males. One of the fascinating aspects in chimp behavior is male dominance. And over the 27 years of the study, there have been five top-ranking males. And the first one was already top-ranking when I got to know him. That was Goliath. I have no idea how he got to be there. But the other four who followed him, each one has had his own completely individualistic way of getting to the top. Mike took over from Goliath. Mike was a small, middle-aged, low-ranking male but he had a tremendous motivation to get to the top. He incorporated empty kerosene cans into this spectacular male charging display when the individual rushes across the ground, sometimes upright, drags branches, hurls rocks. Mike kicked and hit empty cans ahead of him. He could manage as many as three, and he would charge straight towards a group of chimps who were at that time his superiors. Inevitably, they fled, and sometimes he would then sit where they had been and they would gather and they would begin to groom him. And as far as we know, he got to the top without one single physical fight, just by bluff and brains, because all the males had opportunities to use those cans. Only Mike consistently made use of them. Well, Mike reigned for six years, and then the top rank was taken over by a much heavier, more powerful, more aggressive, and younger male, Humphrey. And the interesting thing about Humphrey's takeover, which was simply a one-time fight, he charged up to Mike, who was eating bananas, attacked him, chased him up a tree, pulled him down to the ground, attacked him again, and that was it. From that point on, Humphrey was top-ranking male. But the interesting thing about it was that for at least two years, Humphrey was much, much stronger than Mike. Mike had already lost many of his teeth. They were broken and worn. He was old. And he had maintained his position through tradition because Humphrey remembered him in the old days and it was customary for Humphrey to pay respect to Mike. Well, suddenly Humphrey worked up the courage, attacked Mike, took over the top rank, but he only lasted one and a half years. And he was challenged by a younger, smaller, but far more intelligent male, Figgen. Now, where Mike had made use of empty kerosene cans to get to the top, Figgen made use of his close, supportive relationship with his elder brother, Fabian. And Figgen would only challenge Humphrey when Fabian was in the same group 
and then Fabian would come in and support Figen and the two of them would do these charging displays side by side. And gradually Humphrey got more and more tense and nervous until one day Figen had got sufficient self-confidence to actually attack Humphrey, which he did when Humphrey was lying in bed in his nest and Figen dropped down from above and attacked him. And then when Humphrey climbed up and made another nest, Figen attacked him again. And from then, then on, Figen was dominant over Humphrey. Figen then reigned for 10 whole years. And then he was challenged by a very young, extremely determined male goblin who had different tactics. Again, he just made use of persistence. He had no special companion to help him. He had no empty cans lying around. But he would display towards his rivals again and again and again and again and again. And even if he was attacked, and even if he was hurt, as soon as he was better, he would just be right back where he was before. And so he got to the top through persistence. What characterized Goblin and Figgin and Mike is that they were all small, they were all intelligent, and they all had tremendous motivation to get to the top. And we now know that it's not a question of strength and size. The heaviest chimp we've ever had at Gombe, old Jomeo, he has never risen to more than second rank. He's just not interested in things pertaining to social dominance. And when he was already the heaviest male, he actually allowed himself to be chased out of a tree and ran off screaming by a mere female. And it is, incidentally, a very male-dominated society. So that gives you some idea of the differences in personality and techniques and behaviors that we've seen in uh, males over the years. The competition of males for dominance is a common feature of animals that live in groups, humans included. Among animals, this competition is usually for mates or for territory. Among many animal groups, only the winner of the dominance competition is allowed to breed. Lesser males have no offspring, and only the genes of the strongest, biggest, and best are passed on to the next generation. Jane Goodall, however, discovered that that is not necessarily the case with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees basically have a promiscuous society. But I think one of the most fascinating things is the fact that they have different mating patterns. Sometimes a female who's in estrus may be surrounded by most or even all of the adult males of her group and may be mated by them one after the other. Sometimes the highest ranking male present in the group in which she is will show possessive behavior, keep close to her, and inhibit the other males from mating with it as much as he can. Most fascinating of all, any male, even a low-ranking male, even a cripple, if he's socially skillful, can persuade a female to leave the central part of the community range and accompany him out towards the periphery of the home range. And if he can keep her there throughout her estrus, throughout the period when she's likely to conceive, then he has a good chance of siring a child. And this means that every single male in the community has a good chance of perpetrating his own unique genes. And I think that's one of the reasons we get a lot of genetic diversity in chimps. Because, of course, in baboons and many of the other monkeys, it's the strongest, most aggressive, highest-ranking males who sire most of the babies. Not all of them, but most of them. The ethologist is never content to merely observe a fact. He wants to know why that fact is true. Why, for example, are chimpanzees, as Jane Goodall has observed, promiscuous? Why is it that among chimps it is not only the dominant males who mate? Jan van Hoff is a professor of ethology at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands who studies chimpanzees in a captive colony. Chimpanzees live in very loosely and flexibly organized communities. That's to say, they split up and fuse. They are promiscuous. Gorillas, by contrast, live in very cohesive, strictly organized harem groups in which there is a single dominating grey-backed meal which may have satellite meals within it. Gibbons, siamangs, the other 
the smaller apes, the lesser apes as they are called, they live in monogamous pairs, in little families. And the orangutan is exceptional among diurnal primates in that it's the only one who goes his own way most of the time, who is solitary, forages his own sound. Now, if one sees that, one notices that this also reflects their character. Chimps couldn't live, probably, in a gorilla system. Um, that would break up. So there is, it has something to do with they are, if I may use that anthropomorphic word, they're happy in a certain kind of social environment. But the next question is, why should they want to live there? And that's an evolutionary question, of course, because one wants to understand social processes and the social organization which results from that as an adaptive response to the circumstances in which the species has been living and developed. That is, one assumes that animals live in that particular social environment because in the course of natural selection, the animals that did so were better off. They could follow their primary interest, let's say safety, finding food, finding mates, finding shelter and things like that. Better and more efficiently and more effectively if they were in a group than if they were alone. Ultimately, the test of evolution is always in terms of fitness. That is, if you are able to generate more offspring into the next generation, a larger fraction of that next generation, then the characteristics that made you successful in doing so will be propagated as well. That's evolution, natural selection. Individuals obviously strive for control to get control over things and that's also control over your social fellows it's rather it's of course nicer if you can determine your own ways rather than be dependent on what the others want you to do so this seems to be a fundamental uh, inclination in animals that they want to get control over their affairs and in the social group that manifests itself in, in, in dominance hierarchies. Now, we tend to believe, we tended to believe, that this was a matter of force. Of, uh, we tend to relate dominance and aggression. We see aggression as the instrument to achieve high status position. But we are, we are beginning to find that this is only part of the story and only a, a little part of the story. Jane Goodall talked about aggressive behavior in chimps battling for dominance and about the aggression shown her when she first arrived at Gombe. She has shown us that aggressive behavior involves more than mere brute violence and that for all their apparent ferocity, chimps seldom seem to actually harm one another. These observations echo the theories advanced by the late Austrian ethologist Conrad Lorenz Lawrence studied the aggressive behavior of many different species in his classic book on aggression. He was not happy with the English language title to his book. On aggression, there's one wrong expression in my book and one wrong title, which I didn't realize until I saw the French translation, where the French translator had rightly translated it on aggressivity. And when you speak of aggression, you are really thinking of violence, and which I'm not. And aggressivity is something very different from violence, because animal aggressivity very often, even say generally, stops short of violence. The principle, let the best men win without violence, is the principle of most ritualized fighting in animals, whether you fight boar or stags or ganders, it's, or fish, it's, there are always precautions taken to let the weaker man come out unhurt. And that's in the interest of the species, of course, because if two fish fight or two birds fight, it might just well happen that immediately after the battle, the victor is taken by a predator. And then the vanquished chap is in the position, must be in the position of taking over. And it is surprising how 
how difficult it is to find deadly issue of rival combat. I once gave a lecture, a lecture on aggressivity, and I started by saying, let's drop the word aggression. It's loaded with uh, prejudice and is, is absolutely wrong. Let's call it, I can lick you behavior. What is that? I can lick you behavior. <laughs> and I began by reading, by quoting Mark Twain, uh, in uh, Mark Twain in uh, Tom Sawyer, where the two boys meet, and first they shoulder each other and uh, try their strength in pushing uh, shoulder to shoulder, and then the first thing one says is, I can lick you. And let's call it that because the behavior pattern which I'm talking of is not murder, but is I can lick you behavior. I don't want my worst enemies murdered and lying dead. I want, I want to lick them until they call uncle. Just to approach it for a while from another end. If we have a group of animals, the animals join that group for some reason, as I told you, because obviously within that group they can pursue their vital interests better than if they left that group. Now that means if dominant animals extract more profits from that, they can only go that far. Because as soon as they influence the balance so far that it's not interesting anymore for the others, they will break up the group. And the dominant also loses the group from which he takes these profits. So that means that it is a subtle balance between giving and taking. Now being in a dominant position, is therefore not simply a matter of, of brute force. You have to give back and to pay for being allowed to take. And one of the things is the formation of coalitions in this respect. For instance, what we have been studying in our chimpanzee colony, we see there is an undisputed leader, an animal which has, so to say, is the alpha, as we call it, the others pay respect to him and it is quite clear that males invest a lot of energy in trying to get in this position of control but no male would ever succeed on its own and what we see in the chimpanzee group is the formation of coalitions that is to say particular males join and support other males and then the interesting question is, of course, why should you use support another male to get in charge? Now, the answer seems to be obvious. I mean, logically, something must come back from that. So what we are looking at is, how do they pay for that? And what is, let's say, if I may use this word, what is the transaction which is there? For instance, in having access to females in estrus, that's an aspect that is being monopolized by the dominant male. But when a female is in heat, and that's quite remarkable, one would expect that the tension between the males increases. Uh, that may be so, but certainly it also means that males groom each other much more frequently when a female is in heat than if, if they're not. And particularly the alpha, the dominant male, is, is groomed by the other males. We have an idea that this is a kind of, we call it, groom buying. He softens up the leading male and tries to get permission, if I may say so, to mate with a female. Now, although we are not quite sure about that yet, nevertheless, the evidence is growing that particular animals are more successful in doing that than others, and that particularly the coalition part much more easily gets the permission in this way to mate with a female. So, in this way, we'll reveal what is the, let's say, what are the coins in, uh, with which the transactions are being paid. The males are very closely bonded. They never leave their natal community. They have an interesting relation. On the one hand, they're competing for dominance. On the other hand, it's desperately important that they do maintain close, friendly bonds because they, as a group, are responsible for patrolling the boundaries, 
for repelling strangers, for protecting their own females and youngsters, and for protecting the resources for the females and youngsters. And I think the most important thing in male society is probably social grooming. And again and again, you see two males who've been competing, challenging one another over social dominance. Tense, hair bristling, one of them will suddenly go and start to groom. And gradually, they both will relax. And an hour later, they wander off the best of friends, and they feed together, and they may hunt together uh, or patrol the boundary. And in adult life, we see an immediate response to stress, fear, or pain is to try and make friendly contact with another individual. And you can actually see the alleviation of stress. You can see the chimp who was tense and screaming begin to relax. And nowhere is this more significant than in the maintaining or improving of friendly relationships between members of the same social group. So after a fight, the victim will almost always approach the aggressor, even if very frightened, and adopt submissive behaviors in response to which the aggressor will usually reach out and touch, kiss, pat, or embrace the subordinate. And then social harmony is restored. And this is just so very, very important in chimp society. And I really think it all derives from that close, meaningful mother-child relationship. There is, of course, a problem that when one watches animals in the wild, one may be intruding on their life. But Jane and Diane were both very talented women in this respect. They used different techniques, but they both got themselves accepted by the gorilla or the chimpanzee uh, as though they were a sort of natural part of the world. And it was a most extraordinary feeling that the chimpanzees would treat people as though they almost didn't exist. And uh, it was quite funny, at Jane's camp sometimes one would be walking through a track in the forest and some chimpanzees would be coming towards you along the, the track and without thinking you got off the track and let the chimpanzees go by and they wandered on their way and uh, didn't take any notice of you. People ask me whether my presence at Gombe affects the chimps or how much it affects the chimps' behavior. Well, of course, it's bound to affect it some. But it's one of the things that most people feel really surprised by when they come to Gombe is how, for the most part, the chimps simply ignore us. And I think particularly today, the young ones have grown up. People have been around, friendly people, who sometimes give them bananas. And I think in their world, the most important creatures, without question, are chimpanzees. And then after chimpanzees, you have a, a batch of animals that serve as food, and they're very important to young monkeys, young bushbuck, young bush pigs. And then you have baboons, who are quite good to play with when they're young. And you have humans. And I truly believe that we're just part of the whole general atmosphere and environment of the young chimp as he grows up at Gombe. And the extent to which we affect the behavior, I think it's very little. They do come every so often to our camp to look for bananas, which they may get perhaps once in 10 days, just two or three, enough to keep them coming in. Um, but we feel that they go about their business paying very, very little attention to their human followers. When one of the chimpanzees gets really sick or has a really bad injury, if I can help that individual, I will. The thing is, we don't touch the chimps and we don't handle them at all. So there's not very much we can do, but we can administer antibiotics in bananas. And chimps with really bad wounds 
I have one or two of the Tanzan Tanzanian field assistants follow them all the time, say for a week, giving them three bananas a day with a dose of antibiotic crumbled up in each banana. And a lot of people have said, well, this is interfering with nature. Well, my answer to that is, all over the world we've interfered horribly with nature. And in many places, because of our interference, the forest, the environment, the animals are going or even gone. And I feel that it's very important sometimes to interfere in the other way, in, the, in other words, in the positive way. Now, you know, there was a great school of behavior which demanded that researchers went out in the field, made a short study, shot many of their subjects and examined the stomach contents or what have you. Now, I've never ever heard a criticism leveled at that in terms of interference with nature, and yet these people are out there doing ecological studies. And probably what they've done has had a, quite, an, quite an impact on some of the populations. Jane Goodall started her chimpanzee observation station in 1961. The work continues but has branched out far beyond mere observation. The lessons learned at Gombe have led her into a new career as an animal rights activist. The Jane Goodall Institute was initiated simply to raise funds because all the money to keep this research going is raised by me during lecture tours and from private individuals. And the Jane Goodall Institute in Tucson, Arizona is a tax-exempt organization and we can receive money for, for ongoing research. More recently, we have branched out in a way. We are coping with various issues. One is conservation. Chimps throughout their range in West and Central Africa are vanishing very fast, partly as a result of habitat destruction and partly as a result of the shooting of mothers to capture their infants for use in medical research. Another of the issues which we're very concerned in at the moment is to try to get better conditions for chimps in the biomedical research labs. This is not at the moment tackling the rather sensitive issue as to the extent to which we should be using chimpanzees at all since they're so close to us. We share 99% of our genetic material, for example. But the other day I visited one of the labs in Washington and it was a day I'll never forget. It will haunt me as long as I live. Pairs of three-year-old chimps, that's youngsters at their most active, youngsters who at that age, and I really mean this, have the same kind of intellectual ability and emotional needs and expectations as a human child of about two and a half, crammed together into cages 22 inches by 22 inches and two foot high. They couldn't move. Then when they get a little older, they're separated and placed alone in a cage a little bit bigger, bars above, bars on each side, bars below. And these cages were put into things that look rather like giant refrigerators made of metal with glass doors sealed hermetically, air coming rushing through a vent, making the most terrible noise totally isolated, semi-darkness, nothing to do, nobody to be with. Obviously they become insane. If you have experiments conducted on animals who are suffering tremendous stress to the extent that they become insane, then it's most likely that the results of many of those experiments will be skewed. Now, these animals who are so close to us who are helping us to understand about human illness deserve better treatment than that. I'm Alan Emery, and you've been listening to On the Earth from the audio series The Secret World of Animals. Chimpanzee sounds were recorded in Gombe National Park, Tanzania, by Dr. Christopher Bone of Northern Kentucky University. 
The Secret World of Animals is created, written, and produced by David Tarnow for the Canadian Museum of Nature. <laughs>